who profited from a fake breast cancer charity. He's no stranger to charity fraud. One of the leading advocates for the awareness of breast cancer. Now under investigation. Not turned over financial records. Fake charity called Boobies Raw. Up to 24 years in prison. He told us that the proceeds went to nonprofit organizations. He thought the money she raised was going to charity. Selling merchandise to help fight breast cancer. Making cash off of cancer. For those of you who don't know, I was diagnosed with blood cancer on August 24th, 2022. And Blood Cancer Awareness Month just so happened to be that next month in September, which I spent the entirety of in the hospital doing chemotherapy. This year, as soon as September ended, everywhere I turned my head, there was some kind of marketing for October's Breast Cancer Awareness Month, especially in my school. For every day this past month, our class website would include an image of the pink ribbon and pink boxing gloves, captioning it Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Some student organizations I used to go to even sent out emails saying that for this next month, on Wednesdays, we were pink. Mean Girls reference. But then this got me thinking, September was quite literally a day ago and it was Blood Cancer Awareness Month that whole time. So why is it that none of these images or slogans were presented on our school page or in emails during that month? How come we didn't raise awareness for that? But in October, it's on Wednesdays we wear pink. So I got to thinking and I started doing some research and I learned about the dark history of breast cancer because this shifted from a once important movement in history to becoming a harmful and exploitative movement taken advantage of by the likes of companies and capitalism. One of these exploitative companies just so happened to be started by a man named Adam Shryock, who we will be discussing today. But before we get into that, to introduce myself, my name is Petal Palmer and on this channel I post anything medical mysteries and crime. If that sounds interesting to you, please consider subscribing if you end up liking this video. All right, let's get into this case. Adam Shryock was an ambitious young man. He graduated from the University of Kansas in the early 2010s, and he wanted to embark on a journey of becoming a successful entrepreneur. He soon was able to live out his dreams because it was just about a year starting his company when he amassed a revenue of over $1 million, and his company was growing throughout the states. The only problem was that Adam's company wasn't just your regular business. Adam's company was a charity. In fact, it was a charity meant for raising awareness and funds for breast cancer. Through the merchandise he sold, he racked up millions of dollars, which was supposed to be given for patients of cancer. He continued to grow his company and established base in different cities. But that was, of course, until people found out Adam's true intentions and money for awareness was not it. But before we talk about Adam and the epidemic of fake cancer charities, we need to discuss the dark history of breast cancer awareness because it was nothing like it is today. These days, breast cancer is typically viewed in a light, very welcoming way by the general public. People love showing their support by wearing the pink ribbon and actively promoting activities involving regular checks to make sure people stay safe. But it hasn't always been like this. Actually, up until the 20th century, breast cancer was quite literally considered an unspeakable disease. Anyone who had it was better off hiding it or just not speaking about it at all. The study of cancer is also known as oncology. Today it still holds true, but back then more so than ever, that cancer in general is considered an incurable disease. Cancer is considered one of the oldest diseases ever described by medicine. It has records in ancient Egyptian medical texts dating back to 1600 BC. This comes from texts such as the Edwin Smith and the George Edwards papyri, and it's believed that some of their sources date back to 20 2500 to 3000 BC. Ancient Egyptians described being able to differentiate between benign and malignant tumors, meaning they were able to distinguish between tumors that were most likely not harmful versus tumors that were. And Smith's book was one of the oldest texts to describe treatment of diseases with a scientific approach through the use of surgery as opposed to the magic or mystical methods that were popular at the time. Around this time, scientists believed in the theory of humorism, attributing diseases in the body to an imbalance balanced in four humors, blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. And they were convinced that breast cancer just meant that the person just had an imbalance of too much black bile. Because for one to be considered healthy, they needed to have an equal balance of all four of the humors. If you had breast cancer, meaning you had excess black bile, your treatment consisted of opium and castor oil. 
But with the new technological advances in today's age, this field in medicine and the understanding of this disease is ever increasing. In fact, it's considered one of the most rapidly evolving areas in modern medicine. But that didn't come without its struggles because people didn't have hope in people with this disease surviving. This view actually started to shift in the 20th century when the American Society for the Control of Cancer was developed. Today and since 1945, this is now known as the American Cancer Society. But even with this put in place, there was still a huge stigma surrounding the disease. And it took the effort of several individual people for this disease to finally be recognized. What kickstarted what we have now as the breast cancer movement began through the work of individual women. And one of these women included health activist Mary Lasker. In 1943, Mary's housekeeper was diagnosed with uterine cancer, and because of this, she made a research inquiry with the ASCC to find out what they had going on regarding research for this. But through her inquiry, she found out there was no research being done for this cancer whatsoever, and she found that no place even had money allocated to put towards cancer research, almost as if back then there was just such a pessimistic view on the treatment of cancer that organizations couldn't be bothered to set aside money to contribute towards healing people with it. Kind of like out of sight, out of mind, it's incurable, if there's nothing we can do about it, why spend the energy putting resources towards it? So this was when Mary decided, okay, if you guys aren't going to try contributing to making changes, I'm just going to do it myself. And this was when she became an activist for cancer treatment. She began fundraising campaigns, trying to raise awareness wherever she saw fit. And she eventually made it onto the radio and was ready to say her piece on the topic. But the stigma surrounding this disease was so strong, this radio station didn't even allow her to say the word cancer on air. Like saying cancer was pretty much like saying a curse word at this time. Mary wasn't about to take that. She didn't see the reason why they would be censoring her over a disease like cancer cancer, as if it's something shameful that people should be hiding from. This is when she teamed up with her husband, Albert Lasker. Albert was a successful advertising executive, so he definitely had a good amount of influence over others. And with this influence, he was able to push for radio appeals to raise funds for cancer research. And this initiative worked because they received an influx of donations to the ACS. And the ACS, from then until this day, expend 25% of their budget on cancer research. In 1952, Albert had passed away, and he actually did from cancer. So after this, Mary ended up becoming a lobbyist and successfully pushed for government funding for the National Cancer Institute, or NCI. But things weren't too easy for breast cancer patients because with the disease mainly affecting women and being treated primarily by men, experts lacked the effort and pretty much the knowledge and caring for an individual with such a disease. This showed in the treatment of many women, including Therese Lasser. In 1952, she noticed a lump on her breast. So she went to get it checked out in Manhattan, New York at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and she found out that it was a malignant tumor. These days, with cancer treatment, it's hopefully to be expected that the care team will be willing and able to discuss the options for the post-treatment care and resources one might have access to. At the time, standard of care for breast cancer was a radical mastectomy, and this is what Teresa went into the cancer center for. When she got this all done, she really wanted to know what options were available for her to recover from a procedure like this, and how she could go about living after getting something so serious done to her body. However, during this time, aftercare for women with breast cancer was non-existent. So her surgeon really just dismissed all of her inquiries. To many doctors, these inquiries were just unreasonable. If you had a tumor, the surgeon's job was just to get rid of the tumor. Anything else? None of his business. Getting a prosthesis? Not my problem. Going about everyday life with a mastectomy? Don't care. They were there for one job, and this was to cut the tumor out and go home. She was fed up with the lack of importance dedicated to the care of breast cancer patients, so much so that in 1954, she founded the Reach to Recovery program, addressing these issues that surgeons deemed unimportant. 
And surgeons couldn't handle this at the time. Some even barred Therese from being able to see their patients because they didn't want her advocating for them. This didn't stop her because she still visited women in the hospital with breast cancer to provide the reassurance and support that they weren't getting from the hospital. Not only did doctors lack the empathy in treating breast cancer patients, but in general, they were very judgmental on the choices that women were making with their bodies. Women were expected to play a passive role in their treatment. Doctors would almost sort of threaten them, you know, tell them if they don't follow their standard treatment protocol, they probably won't be alive in the next few weeks. It was only really in the 1970s when women finally started gaining their voice in the treatment of breast cancer. You may or may not know celebrity Shirley Temple Black. She was diagnosed with breast cancer in 1972, but when she was dealing with this, she went by the mantra, the doctor can make the incision, I'll make the decision. This motto heightened the growing advocacy for body autonomy and women's rights. And this is what started the shift from focusing solely on breast cancer awareness to focusing on breast cancer activism. By the early 1980s, breast cancer support groups started popping out throughout the nation, and many women were challenging the views that society had placed on women who had undergone or would continue to undergo the standard care of treatment. Women who had gotten a mastectomy were expected to wear a prosthesis, or if not, they were expected to get breast reconstruction done. If they didn't do this, they were made to feel like they were less than or not whole. Andre Lord was one of the first people to challenge this view before passing away from breast cancer in 1992. And it was actually the year before that when the pink ribbon was born. And this was initially started by a woman named Charlotte Haley. Charlotte had multiple family members diagnosed with breast cancer, and in 1991, she began making peach-colored ribbons for breast cancer awareness. With these ribbons, she attached a postcard reading, the National Cancer Institute's annual budget is $1.8 billion, and only 5% goes for cancer prevention. Help us wake up legislators in America by wearing this ribbon. Her ribbons were a call to action, a demand for prevention of this disease and greater accountability. Alexandra Penny, who was a marketing executive, and Evelyn Lauder, who was the senior vice president for company Estee Lauder, saw potential in a ribbon being associated with breast cancer, and they wanted to work with Charlotte. But she said that they were a little too corporate and a little too commercial for her, so she declined. However, because they loved the idea, they ended up just changing the color of the ribbon from peach to pink to start what is now the pink ribbon for breast cancer awareness. And this pink ribbon was further popularized by an organization called the Susan G. Corman Foundation, which is known as Susan G. Corman now. They handed out pink ribbons to participants of their New York City race for breast cancer in 1991. And this helped the pink ribbon become more mainstream for the movement. And women were most definitely feeling empowered because on August 15, 1993, the New York Times Magazine featured their photographer, Matushka, modeling her mastectomy. Headlining this issue, you can't look away anymore. This was the first time a photograph of a mastectomy was presented in mainstream media. Any other time it's been published before that, it didn't reach the masses like a large company like New York Times could reach. And as the years went on, breast cancer awareness and advocacy became normalized in the media. Companies would wear pink, celebrities would show their support, and this was all great until it turned into what it is now. Focus quickly shifted from giving women a voice and empowering them to now the hyperfixation of this particular body part. This birthed many slogans, with one being, save the tatas. Breast cancer essentially became a brand, this feminine thing, a kind of glamorized disease. People loved the brand of breast cancer, and this became very profitable for these companies. And somebody who noticed this profitability of this disease made sure to jump on it as soon as he could. And this person was Adam Cole Shryock. Adam was a man of big ideas. After graduating from the University of Kansas in the early 2010s, he wanted to embark on his path to becoming a successful entrepreneur. And he started thinking about what would be the best way to follow through with his many planned business endeavors. And he finally did get an idea when he realized the potential of starting a charity to raise money and awareness for this ever-going brand 
of breast cancer. This was when he started his breast cancer awareness initiative in September 2010, and he later created his first promotional campaign in February 2011. This campaign shortly led him to launching his own for-profit company, and this company was called Boobies Rock. With the company's blog site stating, Boobies Rock is a creative blend of music, sports, fashion, and pop culture. Established in September of 2010, Boobies Rock has quickly grown to become one of the leading advocates for the awareness of breast cancer across the U.S. He initially started this Boobies Rock out of San Francisco, California, but after just about a year of success, he was able to expand this to operate out of Castle Rock, Colorado in 2012. Throughout this time, he ran many promotional events and was able to build Build a decent sized roster on his staff. He sold shirts, bracelets, bear koozies, anything he could slap Boobies Rock on top of, he sold. What made his company particularly successful was his elaborate business plan because he was able to make these sales through the use of people he was employing. And these people were attractive young women. Adam would place ads online on websites like Craigslist, or he would put up a post on his blog or Facebook searching for models who were able to go around and make these sales in the name of raising money for breast cancer research. These models would be hired to go into bars and go to sporting events to try and sell Boobies Rock merchandise. They were instructed that the money they would be making would be going towards the fight for breast cancer. To be exact, they were telling patrons that 40 to 90% of the proceeds they were making would be going towards charity. But in actuality, this was all a ploy for Adam to make as much money while losing as little money as possible. He was telling these models to tell potential customers that they were taking donations as opposed to selling merchandise. And both the models and customers generally just thought that they were raising money for cancer. They were unaware that they were really just donating to this man. And clearly the donations were coming in because he was racking up a good amount of cash between those years. From June 2011 to December 2012, the Boobies Rock bank account deposited a little over $1 million. And with this money, Adam started funding his luxurious lifestyle. He was able to purchase a BMW. He was residing in an over $2 million home. He used this money to subscribe to online dating apps. He was picking up multiple bar tabs and he was able to even pay for a maid service. In June 2013, he even proposed to his then girlfriend with a massive diamond ring. But that, of course, was all until his little scam began to unravel. A lot of this was from the help of the employees who realized how fraudulent Adam really was. And this includes a woman named Jay Thompson, who recounted her brief D-Day experience as a promotional model for Boobies Rock on a Mary Claire blog post. Jay was a freelance copywriter living in Chicago. While this was a job she loved doing, with it not being a secure position, she was struggling to get fully on her feet. And because of this, Jay often looked into promo gigs she could do on the side for extra cash. And in October 2012, while she was searching online for a side gig she could do, she came across an ad for Boobies Rock on Craigslist. This ad was looking for promotional models who were able to work selling merchandise and raising money during a football tailgate at the University of Notre Dame. They were offering models $200 for a single day of work and they were covering any expenses related to traveling or hotel reservations. Models really just needed to show up and do the simple job they were given, which to them, of course, at the time, they thought was really a good deed. So she replied to the ad, they got everything sorted out, and very soon she was going to be starting her first day as a promotional model. When that day came, she needed to get ready to go from Chicago to Indiana for the game. So she was picked up by a woman who was listed as Laura. I'm not sure what her name actually was, but all I do know is that she was 24 years old, she was blonde, and she picked up Jay in a very nice rental SUV to drive about an hour and a half from Chicago to South Bend, Indiana, where the University of Notre Dame is located. During their trip, they made one stop in Northwest Indiana to pick up two other models. And while on this long drive, Laura was just telling Jay about how much she loved this job. She was describing how she gets to take all sorts of trips around the country. And all she has to do is pick up promotional models and drive them to football games while getting to do so in these fancy cars. She was essentially letting Jay know, like, this is the job to have. Like, I'm living the dream right now. Jay was just listening to this before they arrived at their hotel. And when they 
did finally arrive, they all checked in and presumably just settled down for the night to get ready for the first day, which would have been the next morning. Now, this is where things started getting a little bit weird because when they checked in, they found out they needed to be sharing a room. But not just sharing a room, they needed to share beds. And Jay had to share a bed with Laura, a woman she had just met for the first time a few hours ago. But once the night was over, they all got up just before sunrise and the first thing they did was just stuff all the merchandise into bags. And when they finished, Laura drove Jay and the other models to the University of Notre Dame football parking lot so they could begin working at the tailgate. This was where some more red flags began though, because before they got out that car and into the parking lot, Laura said to them, hey, like we have permission to be here, but if you see any security guards, walk the other way. Because apparently security guards often made a fuss or made it a hassle for the models to do their job at the games. She followed this by telling them like, hey, make sure whenever you're approaching customers, they should avoid using terms like buy or sell and that they were rather awarding prizes to those who donated to this cause of fighting breast cancer. And Jay just felt a bit weirded out with these new rules. If they were allowed to be there, why avoid security? If this money is going towards a good cause, why does it matter the words they used to describe it? This was all very questionable, but they were already there. They were in their uniform and she thought she was doing a good deed. They even informed her of a $50,000 pledge that they had towards a charity in Detroit called the Pink Fund. So she was just going to see how it all went and just complete her job for the day. And in the end, it actually wasn't too bad. She initially felt a bit awkward going up to people to discuss breast cancer, but the tailgaters were generally very nice and they were very welcoming of her and the other models. And many of them were very generous. A lot of the tailgaters were offering their money and didn't want any of the prizes in return. Jay even described that one man slipped her a $20 bill and with tears in his eyes whispered that his wife had passed away from breast cancer. These interactions helped reinforce that they were doing a good deed and by the end of that day, Jay felt more confident that what she was doing was in fact a good thing. When the game was just about to start and the tailgaters began heading into the stadium, Jay, Laura, and the other promo models met up in the SUV and they were going to count all the money they collected from their day of work. And they did a good job because they collected well over a thousand dollars in cash. Now, while they were counting this money, at some point, Laura said something along the lines of her feeling like a drug dealer every time she worked because she always just had to collect so much money and carry these large wads of cash in bags, which she would bring through airport security and carry on the plane. But then this made Jay wonder, why is it that she was carrying all of that cash? why doesn't she just deposit it somewhere? And so she asked Laura why the money doesn't get put into a bank. And Laura just simply answered, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Now, when they arrived back in Chicago and Jay was about to head back inside, Laura had stopped her and asked her, hey, like, would you be up to work for us again in a few days? And she followed this by saying how Jay just stood out to her so much and how she was only asking her and not the other models because she saw something different in Jay. She told her that she could become a manager just like her someday. By this point, Jay already felt like things were quite suspicious. She thought it didn't make sense that they were donating money to this charity, yet they weren't tracking how much they were making when doing this. And with just the weird sleeping arrangements and the rules they had, Things seemed off, but again, Jay's never done this work before, and she was flattered by what Laura told her and was curious about pursuing this opportunity. So a few days went by, and on a Sunday morning, Laura picked her up, same stuff, arrived at the game, and Jay got ready to do her work. This is where things again got very weird. It was a rainy day, so the vibes were already a bit off, you know, just gloomy, maybe less people out. She was still just doing the same old stuff. However, when Jay was walking around, multiple people were coming up to her and just saying to her, you know you're running a scam, right? Like they were telling her she was scamming people. Now, Jay was obviously feeling a bit uneasy after this. She already felt like Laura was being very weird, but now here are people, the public, telling her that she was running a scam. So again, she finished up her day Laura collected all the money and she got dropped off back home. And as soon as she got inside, the first thing Jay did 
was start doing some deep digging into this company. She wanted to find out what these people were talking about. So she went online and started doing some research on Boobies Rock. And she, in fact, did find out some information. The first thing she noticed was the fact that on their website, they weren't a nonprofit organization. They were a for-profit company that made donations. Then she even found a website called ripoffreport.com. And on this website, Boobies Rock had a scam report alleging that they weren't even making the donations that they claimed to have made to charities. There was just a list of comments about this company. In fact, a post dated on August 21st, 2011 by somebody named Kelly read, I am a previous employee of the company Boobies Rock, and although I've defended the company in the past, I quit my position in May when I realized that none of the donations had been made to the various nonprofits that Mr. Adam Shryock had pledged to donate to, as promised. Adam Shryock is currently in a lawsuit with Keep a Breast for using their slogan, I Love Boobies, previous to using Boobies Rock. So there was essentially some tea on him, especially the fact that he initially started using the slogan, I love boobies, and then switched it to boobies rock because clearly you can't just take another company's slogan. Jay continued to do some more research. And when she did, she found out that he had a history of complaints against him, all having to do with business fraud. Now, at this moment, Jay was pretty shocked, but she was also feeling very guilty because she just worked for them twice twice and raised money for this potential scam of a business. She wanted to find out more. So she immediately went to Facebook and made a post asking if anyone she knew knew anything about it. And she posted, is Boobies Rock a scam? Not too long went by when Jay received an email. And this email was from a company called The Seven Group, which was an affiliated company with Boobies Rock founded by Adam. And in this email, they were accusing Jay of slander, and they even threatened to bring a lawsuit against her if she continued to defame this organization. So she did her research yet again and decided to call each and every one of the charities that Boobies Rock had listed on their website and all the ones they claimed to have donated money to. A good chunk of these organizations have never even heard of Boobies Rock before. And the most money that some of them claimed to have received was $100 or $200 a year or two prior. We're talking about a company who made over $1,000 one afternoon at a tailgate. A woman at a nonprofit even almost yelled at her on the phone saying that she was working for a bad organization and that what she was doing was wrong. And even when Jay corrected her and assured her that she quit and was never going back and she was now just trying to reveal or expose their scam, the lady still just yelled at her that she should have did her research before working with them. Jay did agree with this. She should have done research before working with them because they weren't just scamming their donors or the organization but they were scamming their employees and she was one of the employees who did get scammed. On Adam's Facebook, she just saw all of the expensive things he boasted and the events he would go to and she knew he was able to afford these things from the scam he was pulling. She wanted to put an end to this case of fraud. So she started to compile her research and put it all together in a PDF document. And with this evidence, she sent the PDF to various news outlets. But even though she sent it out to dozens, she only got a response from one outlet which was the Chicago Sun-Times. And the response was sent from somebody named Stephanie Zimmerman. Stephanie was a consumer-focused investigative journalist and was often referred to as the fixer. She contacted Jay and also contacted the women who Jay worked with at Notre Dame to interview them for a major article she hoped to create. And during this time, the fraudulent company was trying their best to stop this investigation from happening. Seven Group emailed Jay three times urging her to stop speaking with reporters and the emails they sent to her were very odd. She quoted, they said things like, this can be very dangerous when you decide to start doing things you are doing and I hope that our previous decisions to take action against those who spread these false statements is enough to show you how serious we take this. Why would you want to put yourself in a situation that could potentially cost you thousands of dollars? And they even ended their final email telling her that she should expect to hear from their attorney. But 
Despite the threats of a lawsuit, Jay continued doing what she was doing to expose their scam. And this involved contacting the Better Business Bureau, the IRS, and the Illinois and Indiana Attorney Generals. She made progress when the Illinois Attorney General invited her to sign an affidavit and participate in an in-person interview. To clarify, an affidavit is a written statement confirming that one swears to tell the truth, which can be used as evidence in court. She even got a response back from the city of Chicago who told her that they were doing whatever they could to get involved, which at the time included possibly citing Boobies Rock for selling merchandise in the city without having a permit to do so. And like Seven Group promised in the emails, their attorney was most definitely going to contact Jay because it wasn't too long after when she received a call from their attorney and he asked her, why are you so angry? Why did you make up all these things about them? What was wrong with your employment at Boobies Rock? Could you guys just maybe set aside your differences and come to an understanding? They just wanted to end whatever this beef was that she had with them. From this call, it was obvious that they must have told him that she was just a bitter employee who was upset to be not a part of the company anymore. So she told him about all of the company's shady practices and all of the reports and all this information was in fact news to him. In fact, when Jay was contacting all of the charities earlier in her investigation, she ended up getting in contact with the CEO of the Pink Fund, which was the charity in Detroit that Boobies Rock pledged to donate $50,000 to. Their CEO was named Molly McDonald, and Molly told her that they weren't even aware that this pledge even existed. Yet, apparently the Boobies Rock attorney was fully under the impression that Molly signed the contract for this pledge. So after she revealed this, the attorney was off the phone and he never contacted Jay again, and Adam's plan really began to unravel. On November 27, 2012, the Chicago Sun-Times posted an article about about Boobies Rock. And this article was called Cashing In on Cancer, which was pretty much calling them out for being a scam. But get this, just a few days before this article was posted, Boobies Rock in fact sent the pink fund that $50,000 that they pledged to donate, almost as if they were anticipating getting called out and needed to do some damage control to not look like a scammer. He even shortly donated $25,000 to the Young Survival Coalition as a settlement because he was about to be hit with a lawsuit for using their name despite never being involved with them. And investigators were really onto him. On April 26, 2000, 2013, a Kansas State investigator, Kayla Stansbury, sent both Adam and the Boobies Rock Incorporation separate subpoenas, which are written documents ordering them to attend court. Part of this order permanently prohibited them from destroying any of the logs they had, moving any of the funds they earned, and engaging in any kind of restructuring of their business. They were still continuing their practice at the time. However, a court order from the state of Colorado was then put in and on July 8th, 2013, they placed a temporary restraining order or TRO for Adam to stop operating the Boobies Rock Incorporation. This TRO also included the seven group as well as another group he owned called Say No to Cancer. And Jay made sure to stop as many people as she could from getting involved with this fraudulent company. She saw that many women were still posting on social media selling the same merchandise that she was selling for this company at some point. So she started contacting all of these accounts, urging that these promo models quit and encouraging them to reach out to local news outlets and attorney generals of their state to try stopping this scam from continuing on. And many did quit working with this company after finding this out. In fact, Jay learned that Boobies Rock emailed all of the promo models saying that she was doing all this because she was angry she got fired and that the reason Stephanie Zimmerman covered them in an article was because she was Jay's aunt, even though they weren't related at all. But Jay continued reaching out to different media outlets. She was giving them a list of employees who were willing to talk about their experiences at Boobies Rock. And this all seemed to work because word started to spread and media outlets, news TV outlets were starting to run short segments on this. And this story was even featured on USA Today's website. Eventually, Adam was prohibited from raising money for any kind of charity and Boobies Rock was officially shut down. All he needed to do 
was not touch a charity ever again. But this clearly was not an easy task for him because in January 2014, he was found guilty of contempt of court because Adam decided to start another charity group, this time called I Heart This Bar. He started this organization in August 2013, literally just a month after being ordered to stop his Boobies Rock scam. And with this group, he was still using promotional models and was paying them to walk around bars to raise money, specifically $65,000 to a supposed scholarship fund, which didn't exist. So he was sentenced to two weeks in jail because of this. And clearly his scamming career wasn't over because just a year later in January 2015, Adam was sentenced to six months in jail because he decided to falsely associate himself with an organization called Stupid Cancer. Adam was essentially pretending to be a consultant for Stupid Cancer, but Stupid Cancer testified that he had no association with the organization and they received no fines from him whatsoever. So he was sentenced to six months, but this still didn't stop him because a few months later in April, he was charged in another fraud case. Him and his business partner, Genevieve Cruz, were taking mattresses from a nonprofit Genevieve worked at. With these mattresses, they were selling them out the back of a rental storage to make a profit. Adam pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 90 days in jail, followed by four years of probation. His scams allowed him to accumulate over 2,200 cash deposits, and this totaled into over $1.8 million into his accounts. Yet only $75,000 of that was donated to charity groups and prosecutors said that this little amount was only so that he could avoid possible lawsuits. He eventually was ordered to return $1.89 million in gross receipts and he had to pay $4 million in civic penalties and Adam received a permanent lifetime ban from engaging in charity work. Now how was it that this man was able to develop a company that was so successful, yet so fraudulent. Well, this all ties back to the issue with breast cancer, and that is how it shifted from a movement intended to give women body autonomy to now this glamorized brand. Some companies, whenever they address breast cancer, they do it in a way to not address this very serious disease, but to instead address this body part. A lot of these campaigns are promoting slogans like, I love boobies or save the tatas. But why are we focusing on saving the tatas but not focusing on saving the actual person. This view of emphasizing just the body part objectifies those with breast cancer and takes away from the actual complex and varying experiences one with breast cancer goes through. Like I mentioned, Blood Cancer Awareness Month is in September, just the month before Breast Cancer Awareness Month in October. But I've personally never seen anything like save the blood or I love white blood cells. And this is not to compare any type of cancer Cancer because it's important to raise awareness and funds for all types. This is to help you realize that there's clearly a strong emphasis on a particular type and it's not for the right reasons of it being very common and having horrible effects for those who are affected, but it's emphasized because people sexualize it. More than 70% of breast cancer cases affect women older than 50 years old and women who are African American are most likely to develop and pass away from breast cancer. Yet in majority of the posters you see, this disease is represented by young women in their 20s and who are mainly white. Why is it that this is the demographic chosen to represent this disease when it's not the demographic who's mainly affected? This is not to say that this demographic is not affected, but this is all because companies know who they need to put on their posters to make their cash. And this exploitative nature allows companies to take advantage of this wide widespread support to make profit from their own products. They know that participating in Pinktober is a good marketing strategy, and so they make sure to flaunt the color pink or to slap the pink ribbon on everything they can to generate cash flow and profit off of this very deadly disease. Now, while of course it is through the help of many companies who are donating proceeds to charity that breast cancer research is so well funded, this doesn't stop the fact that there are still companies out there who capitalize off of this deadly disease while not 
not giving anything in return to help it. Some companies even contribute to the growing problem. And this is called pinkwashing. Pinkwashing is a form of marketing where companies slap the pink ribbon on their products, advertising in the name of breast cancer awareness. But with pinkwashing, these products that they are marketing don't contribute anything to helping breast cancer. In fact, some of these products may even be very harmful. Some are known for causing various types of cancer. There is a vast list of companies who've been accused of pinkwashing. One of the major organizations criticized for pinkwashing is one mentioned earlier, Susan G. Komen. This organization was named after a 36-year-old woman named Susan G. Komen who passed away from breast cancer in 1980. Her sister, Nancy Brinker, founded this organization in 1982 to honor her sister and raise awareness for this disease. While this is one of the largest organizations for breast cancer advocacy in the States, they still have faced many criticism of potential pinkwashing. Many people were concerned with the organization's partnerships because a lot of the partnerships they were doing were with companies who created products with material that are harmful to people and said to even be cancer causing. This included a partnership with KFC in 2010 where they were offering buckets for the cure, which consisted of fried and grilled chicken being served in pink branded buckets. Several media outlets criticized this because one of the main risk factors for breast cancer includes obesity, which is partially caused by unhealthy eating habits. People thought that it was odd that they would be promoting unhealthy fast food that could be harmful to one's health instead of promoting things that would be helpful for them. Because part of breast cancer awareness or breast cancer advocacy should include not just how to treat breast cancer or not just how to help out a person with breast cancer, but how to prevent breast cancer in the first place. But in another sense, a lot of people said that this brought light to the topic and allowed more people to become aware of this movement, especially as KFC contributed over $4.2 million to the foundation. However, that wasn't all because they even launched a perfume brand in 2011 called Promise Me. This was met with quick backlash and they quickly removed this product as there was concern of potentially harmful ingredients. And these ingredients included comarin, oxybenzone, choline, and galaxolide. These were just a couple examples from the several complaints they had against them, and also not including many other companies who use the pink ribbon on potentially harmful products. The list truly just goes on. On top of the fact that many people who've had or currently have breast cancer aren't even a fan of Pinktober themselves, many feel as though the entire month is just a painful reminder of all they've been through. Any Bond is a woman who has been living with metastatic breast cancer since 2015. She shares several posts on her TikTok and on Instagram about her life with this disease and explaining why pinkwashing or the hyperfixation of just the body part when discussing breast cancer is harmful. Coming from an actual metastatic breast cancer patient, she explains how many of them don't feel good about Pinktober as companies are able to capitalize on this brand brand of a disease when they are truly the ones who are suffering from it. One video in particular I thought explained some things well was this one. This morning I was walking my dog and I saw a girl with the shirt on that said boobies rule breast cancer awareness month and that's all the shirt said and I had to stop myself because I hadn't had my coffee yet from being like hey by the way your shirt's a little offensive to people like me who've actually survived breast cancer. Why is that you might ask? Uh, well here's the thing when you have breast cancer, do you know where the cancer is? Why it's in your breasts. So when you say things like save the boobies, save second base, all these things that are sexualizing breasts in order to do something with breast cancer, it is so offensive. You know that like over 70% of the time you get your entire breasts removed when you have cancer? Because that's what's killing you. The tumors in your boobs. So when you make the focus of a breast cancer awareness campaign just about like how much you love boobs, it doesn't help us at all. It's supposed to be uh, about awareness of breast cancer and not just boobs in general. Yeah? Now, this isn't to say that Pinktober is terrible or that it should be canceled because many breast cancer patients do feel like it's nice to have, but they more so mean it's nice when it's done to actually help the cause, not to utilize it as a sales or a marketing technique. What this also does is take away from the fact that 
men can get breast cancer too. Granted, only about 1% of breast cancer cases in the Western world are of men. This doesn't stop the fact that those 1% of men do exist. And these campaigns fail to include them, of course, because a male's chest isn't as marketable as a woman's. This is harmful because it can stigmatize men and make them feel ashamed or embarrassed to be a man with this women's disease who are intruding on a movement that they have no business being a part of, when they 100% should be a part of the movement because they are a part of it. Now, this is not to say that saying I love boobies is wrong. If anything, that could probably do more than saying nothing at all. But what needs to be done is ensuring that when you're throwing on your pink and plastering the ribbon everywhere, that you're actually understanding why you're doing it. And you take the time to acknowledge that it's not about saving the tatas, but it's instead about saving the person. And if you do want to contribute to the movement, make sure you're looking into each company or organization and that you know their mission behind what they're doing. I haven't personally had any experiences with breast cancer charities. However, when doing my research, I found a few from breast cancer patients who said that they seemed to be helpful to them. This included the Breast Cancer Research Foundation, the National Breast Cancer Coalition Fund, and Breast Cancer Prevention Partners. However, a lot of the time, ways you could help could just be going to a cancer center and seeing if you could donate directly to them or if you could volunteer your time to help them. I know whenever I'm in for chemo, there's always a basket with hats and scarves people have knitted for me and other cancer patients to just take. And there are local support groups you could always message to see how you may help the patients there. It's always just recommended that if you want to donate to any organization that you do your research so that you can learn what they're truly about to hopefully stay safe from scams like this. And remember to not view this as saving the tatas, but rather saving the person. But that is it for today's video. There's so much more I feel like I could go into, especially regarding the capitalism of breast cancer and other diseases. So stay tuned for a potential part two if that's something you guys would be interested in. Again, thank you so much for watching and please consider subscribing so you don't miss any other videos involving medical cases, crime, and mysteries. Bye now.